start recording. All right. So in group B, I do not see Madison Carver, she's here, her destiny, Tatum. So we will start with Carrie Palmer. Then we'll hear from Lucas of Upper, Emma Williams, and then I'll go back to Eve after. All right, so I'll do a quick wipe down again. You can never be, as you know, during this pandemic too safe. So I ask all of you, whenever you finish making your presentation, if you don't mind, just wipe down everything surfaces here, as well as the keyboard, and that will be in keeping with what we need to do. Diapers can help reduce that number. 
Another great way to be a green parent is to make better food choices for yourself and your child. Did you know that becoming a vegetarian is actually one of the most impactful ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint? Of course, children still need different vitamins and minerals and proteins to thrive. However, even just cutting down on meat consumption can make a very big difference. Just be sure you talk to your child's pediatrician before you make big changes in their diet. Nursing is also one of the best ways to reduce weight when raising a child. There are endless health benefits to nursing. It's free, and of course, there's virtually no weight involved. Um, unfortunately, nursing can be very difficult, and it's impossible in some situations. So if you do end up needing to use infant formula for your babies, choose the larger cans of formula because that will leave less waste to be sent to the landfill. Also be sure that you're using BPA-free bottles because BPA is another one of those chemicals that is a known carcinogen. Also make your own food as possible. It's very easy to go to Walmart and see all these little tiny plastic cans of baby food and be really tempted to buy those for your child because they're so easy to use. However, if you can get your own carrot puree them and serve them in a reusable dish, that's much more environmentally friendly. If you do decide to use um, food, baby food, easy to use baby food, just make sure that you're buying the things in reusable containers like these little glass jars. We have been able to reuse these little glass jars when my son was an infant in so many different ways. And anything that you can't reuse, see if you can recycle it. An easy way to determine what you can recycle, um, an easy way to recycle is to change up what you think about how you're bringing things into your home. So make sure you're actively trying to bring things in that you can recycle. This video actually should help you understand a little bit better about what you can and can't recycle. There is nothing like a hot cup of tea in the morning. That is until I'm done and I have to decide what to do with my cup. Can I recycle it? Is that a trick question? Yeah, this is a great question. And I just figured you can recycle I don't know, this is so hard. The confusion means that things that are actually garbage still end up in the recycling stream. About 25% of what Americans try to recycle can actually be recycled. Waste management experts say what's going on here is something called aspirational recycling. When people are unsure if an item can be recycled, they recycle it because it feels like the right thing to do. And while our intentions are good, this behavior isn't harmless. Even small amounts of contamination can turn entire halls of otherwise recyclable materials into trash. And the problem has been growing. The rate of recycling contamination more than doubled in the last decade. So why is this happening? Well, it's at least in part due to a major shift in how Americans recycle. Beginning in the 1990s and 2000s, municipalities implemented single stream recycling programs. Paper, metal, plastic, and glass no longer needed to be sorted. They could all live in one bin. Communities quickly adopted the practice, and by 2014, 80% of all curbside recycling programs in the U.S. were single stream. The problem is, there's evidence that when we put all our recycling into one bin, we're more likely to throw trash in there along with it. Take two neighboring counties in Florida, for example. Palm Beach County, where residents must pre-sort their recyclables, had a contamination rate of only 9%, while Broward County's single stream program had a contamination rate of 30%. Single stream recycling takes the responsibility to sort off of the individual and shifts it to materials recovery facilities, or MRFs, where trash gets sorted from recycling by machines, but also by workers who often have to remove waste by hand. Pizza boxes contaminated with grease, 
electronics that aren't processed at standard recycling facilities, even the likes of Christmas lights, animal carcasses, and bowling balls. In Portland, workers remove thousands of dirty diapers every month. In a perfect world, everyone would just know how to recycle correctly. But short of that, there's something we can all start doing differently right now. Unless you are absolutely sure, don't recycle it. In fact, recycling education campaigns encourage the opposite. When in doubt, the best option may be to throw it out. Most people. All right, so hopefully that gives you an idea of what you uh, one of the big things that parents struggle with is the amount of clothes that they bring into their home and their children. You know, they are growing constantly, new clothes are expensive, and you're going to end up with a lot of different clothes. However, one thing that you can do is go purchase used clothing. That way you are not bringing into your home things that have used resources, um, such as like a pair of pants can use up to 80 gallons of water to clean one pair of pants. If you're going to buy used clothing, then you're already investing in a resource that has already been used. You're not investing in new resources. And it also keeps clothing out of landfills. Americans throw away a ton of clothes each year that could still be worn. They've just gone out of fashion. So reusing clothing, especially for children, because they're going to grow out of it super quickly, and donating your clothes when they're through with them is a great way to be more environmentally conscious. Also, limiting what kinds of toys you bring into your home. Up to 90% of the toys on the market nowadays are made from plastic. And those plastics are incredibly difficult to recycle. So when they break, they end up in landfills. If you can purchase used toys for your children, that keeps toys out of the landfill. You can also look for more sustainably made toys and that is more environmentally friendly. Um, look for toys that are wooden, wool, or other organic materials that will decompose or be recyclable when you're through with them. Of course, even if you're not a parent, um, considering the everyday items that you bring into your house can also help reduce your carbon footprint. So for example, try using rags instead of paper towels. Don't use those reusable plastic canvas bags. Use glass Tupperware. Different things like that can end up making a huge impact on your carbon footprint. Children who are raised in homes with environmentally conscious role models will grow up to reduce their own carbon footprint. And the whole goal is to create a better world for the future for our children and for everyone else. So, cloth diapering, considering what food you're eating, and considering what materials you're bringing into your home are great ways to be a person parent. Thank you.
Today I'm doing my presentation on Halloween's history and tradition. Um, I'm doing this presentation because um, Halloween, like the past of Halloween a little bit, and like other traditions, they interest me. And the points I'll be um, going through today are the history of Halloween, some tradition, and then some of my family traditions. Right. The brief history, um, Halloween came to be with the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. Um, they would light bonfires and dress up in, in costumes to warn off ghosts. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Samhain is a pagan religious festival. And then a man named Pope Gregory III made November 1st the time of honor of Saint. And since this day was on the 1st of, 1st of November, uh, the 31st of October was called Halloween, and then it was later changed to Halloween. Um, tradition. Um, there's like wearing scary costumes and then going trick or treating in the Scottish way, um, being scared of black hats at Halloween, bowing for apples, um, spotting bats, and lighting candles and bonfires. These are some of the ones that were like up, like obscure a little bit to me. Um, wearing scary costumes. This tradition started with the the Celts and they would dress up in order to scare off the belief of their belief of evil spirits. Um, trick or treating the Scottish way, they would go door to door asking for money or, or food in return for prayers or dead souls. Um, being scared of black cats on Halloween. Some people think that seeing a, bad, seeing a black cat on Halloween night is a sign of like essentially the devil of bad luck. Um, falling for apples. This is like a simple tradition that's like without using your hands and only your mouth. You try to get, you try to get apples out of a bin filled with water. They usually have like contests and competitions and things like this. And then um, spotting bats. The cows would use their bonfires to attract the insects, and the insects would attract the bats, and then they would see throughout the night who could who could spot the most bats and whoever would win the winner. And then lighting candles and bonfires. Without well, back in the beginning of Halloween with the cats, they believed that bonfires and candles were the way for the souls to seek the afterlife. So that's what they did. And then some of my family traditions for Halloween, for me and my family, we like decorate the house a little bit with like little props and cobwebs. Uh, we'll color pop, we'll color pumpkins with pictures we got off the internet. Um, we used to all go trick-or-treating, but now we take my little sister out so she can have the fun, the, the same fun that we did. We also get together with the extended family. Um, Halloween, I feel like, has changed a lot since it first started. When it first started, I feel like it was more about like, evil spirits, and now I feel like it's more aimed at like decorating, having fun, and eating candy. I don't know if you did either. She wanted her roommate who could help with the cooking, but she wanted someone who loved cats. The one thing we could both agree on is getting Geico to help with our winter insurance. Can you <laughs> From communion with the dead to pumpkins and pranks, Halloween is a patchwork holiday stitched together with cultural, religious, and occult traditions that span centuries. It all began with the Celts, a people whose culture had spread across Europe more than 2,000 years ago. October 31st was the day they celebrated the end of the harvest season in a festival called Sowen. That night also marked the Celtic New Year and was considered a time between years, a magical time when the ghost of the dead walked the earth. It was the time when the veil between death and life was supposed to be at its thinnest. On Samhain, the villagers gathered and lit huge bonfires to drive the dead back to the spirit world and keep them away from the living. But as the Catholic Church's influence grew in Europe, it frowned on the pagan rituals like Samhain. In the 7th century, the Vatican began to merge into the church-sanctioned holiday. So November 1st was designated All Saints Day to honor martyrs and the deceased faith. Both of these holidays have to do with the afterlife and about survival after death. It, it was a calculated move on the part of the church to bring more people to the fold. All Saints Day 
was known then as Hallows. Hallow means holy or sacred. So the translation is roughly Mass of the Saints. The night before, October 31st, was All Hallows Eve, which gradually morphed into Halloween. The holiday came to America with the wave of Irish immigrants during the potato famine of the 1840s. They brought several of their holiday customs with them, including robbing for apples and playing tricks on neighbors, like removing babies from the front of the houses. The young pranksters wore masks so they wouldn't be recognized. But over the years, the tradition of harmless tricks grew into outright vandalism. Back in the 1930s, it really became a dangerous uh, holiday. I mean, there was um, such uh, hooliganism and vandalism. Trick or treating was originally a extortion deal. Give us candy or we'll uh, trash your house. Storekeepers and neighbors began giving treats or bribes to stop the tricks. The children were encouraged to travel door to door for treats as an alternative to troublemaking. By the late 30s, trick or treat became the holiday greedy. Okay, um, I like Halloween mainly because I like doing all like the little traditions and I like when I was a kid, I like the trick or treat and things like that. Um, I also like decorating a lot, so that's why I like it. And then in conclusion, um, I did this presentation so I, I personally could learn some of the facts of Halloween and then hopefully inform some of you guys about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have you all heard about Halloween for this this year? Some people are scaling back a lot of the trick or treating and getting. It's probably for the best. I think a lot of parents are kind of just having small groups to come over and introduce their kids to their parents. So, how long is the pandemic? Yeah. Good job. All right, next we need to hear from Emma Wilden. Then after Emma, we will hear from Emma Chapman. Um, before I start with my presentation, as you guys know, my uh, topic was originally supposed to be foster care. Um, I ended up changing it a little last minute and I'll talk about why I did that. So I'll be able to visit foster care in the next weeks. But today I want to talk about the Infinite Food Service Dog. So the other day I was on the phone with my grandfather, and he's a Vietnam veteran, he's an amputee, and he's suffering from PTSD. Um, recently he completed the process of getting a service dog. And in talking with him about it, I realized that not a lot of people really know all the different types of service dogs and why people have them. So I thought it was kind of important for me to share with you guys today. So this dog is Andy, that's my granddad in the middle of trying to get a service dog. So he just recently completed his training and went to the same impact. We assessed him with his PTSD symptoms and also his mobility because he is amputated from the ankle down on the side. You would never know it if he didn't tell you, but it's nice to have that extra help. Today, I want to talk a little bit about what service dogs do in general and why I'm so passionate about it. Um, a service dog is 
according to the ADA, which is the American Disabilities Act, which is all about individually trained to, to work or perform tasks for a person with a disability. And the ADA also defines a disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more, one or more major life activities. So disabilities can be seen or not seen. Um, most commonly, we think of people who are blind or deaf, um, they have the ability to see. These are the ones that you can see if you're walking down the street. But I think another part of it is the unseen disabilities, like assisted speech. Um, these ones we don't think of as often. So I think it's important to kind of keep in your mind that even if you don't see the disability, it could still be there. So these are search dogs for physical disabilities. They're more um, commonly known. So the first is a guide dog, which is just with visual impairments. For people who are blind or have trouble seeing, they help guide them, especially out in public, um, crossing streets, moving around their own homes. The next are hearing dogs, they just with auditory impairments. Um, this could be someone who is hard of hearing or even deaf. Um, they can help guide if there are certain situations, waking up in the morning or communicating with people in their life, kind of lets them know that this person is hard of hearing. And the last are mobility dogs, these are just with physical impairments. So if someone is in a wheelchair, they help push them, or if they Walking, and thing to note, most service dogs are labs because of their temperament, but depending on the person's disability, it might be a different dog. So obviously mobility dogs would be larger, stronger dogs that can help assist their owner. Hearing dogs, it could be a smaller dog that just has um, a better sense. So it really is catered to that individual. And then the next type of dog is a medical alert dog. These are service dogs that are trained to help with more of the unseen medical issues such as seizures, severe allergies, poor blood sugar, and other life-threatening conditions. So these dogs are trained to sense when their owners start to have, if they have a seizure, they can sense the um, rhythm of their heart, if it starts to like, go out of order. Um, there are dogs that can actually smell peanuts before the owner can even recognize it. Um, this is done to more severe allergies that can possibly be life threatening. Um, low blood sugar, they can sense the drops in um, the person's blood sugar and help assist them if they're out in public and they have to So these dogs, there's not really a physical um, need for the type of dog, but these are just dogs that are very alert and very aware. And then lastly is a psychiatric service dog. This is the type of dog that my grandfather has. Um, they're trained to help with disabilities such as PTSD, anxiety, OCD, and other mental disorders. So something that's important to note is that training for service dogs happens throughout their lives, even after they've been with their owner. It's not a one-time process. Um, it's ongoing throughout their lives. Um, so dogs are trained and then matched with an owner, and after they're their match, their owner um, goes through training with them. So it's a two way street. The owner has to know what commands to give to get help from the dog, and the dog has to know what their owner's commands are. Um, so my granddad, he got his service dog through the Veterans Association. Um, he went to an, a retreat with his dog, and they spent about a week learning commands and learning what he needed to do. Even as he's home with his dog now, he teaches him new things every day, but it reinforces um, skills that you might already know. And this is done through treats. Work dog, service dogs are working dogs. So, kind of like how we don't work for free, we work for money. These service dogs work for a reward, and this helps reinforce that precious help that they give their owners. So, the benefits of a service dog. So. The main benefit of a service dog is to assist their owner with their specific disability. Um, you go through a screening process to determine if you want or not. And then there are professional organizations, both for profit and um, non for profit organizations that help pair the dog with the owner. And they have their dog because of their disability, but some secondary um, 
benefits, they help their owner be more independent and confident in their legal life. So especially with these unseen disabilities, they might go through life and not really, um, they might struggle because of their disability, even though someone might have not noticed. So having a dog just helps them have a smoother day-to-day -day process and not really have to worry about their disability as much as they would otherwise. And then the last reason, which I think is really important, is it provides a mutual companionship. Um, having a service dog is obviously a necessity for um, people with disabilities, but it also helps to kind of have, even if it's not a person, have an um, animal there that kind of knows you and knows what you need and they can assist you with day-to-day -day life. So that's really important to me because I think that everyone needs someone that understands, and even if it's a dog, it's a really important part of someone with a disability's life. And that importance is why I wanted to share this topic with you today. Um, so in conclusion, I think service dogs are often under-recognized, but they're a vital part of the lives of people with disabilities. Um, combination of organizational support and vigorous training helps these dogs become working dogs who provide an essential service to their owners. So I encourage you guys next time you see, see a service dog in public, the ones with the vets. Um, I hope you are able to remember how important they are. Maybe you can help educate others on this topic. Thank you. guys, my name is Ian Addison, and um, my project or my speech is on why is it important to stretch. This is kind of in general as well as a little bit more specifically when it comes to 
doing physical activities and stretching before and or after. So <clears throat> there's basically three different types of stretching. And the first one is static, which is probably the most common that we can uh, think about. It's where you stand, sit, or lie still in a single position for about 45 seconds. So an example of that would just be like, you know, some, some toe touches like that. We just want to hold it for a while. It's not a very active movement. You kind of just stand still and do it. And uh, that brings you to my next one, which is the uh, dynamic stretching, which is actually probably the best one for you. It's more of a movement-based stretching, and you don't really hold it. You know, it's more of just like a, a continuous movement. It gets your blood moving. It gets your heart rate up, which is good to do before any kind of physical physical activity that where you really exert yourself, you want to do some dynamic stretching before you get into it. And uh, it also warms your muscles and it's something that you want to perform more so just slowly. And the last one is kind of probably the, the least common or the one that uh, the least amount of people know about and it's called ballistic. It's kind of a quick jerky movement and it's very related to static um, stretching in the sense that it's the same movements. So for example, if you're doing a little toe touch, it's more of like a bouncing motion, which is probably not the best thing for you if you're not like an experienced stretcher, because you're a lot more likely to pull something. And if you're stretching your groin and you start bouncing in and out, you have more likeliness to uh, kind of tear something or to really seriously hit, hurt yourself. So I'm gonna get into the kind of five um, basic benefits of stretching. The first thing is posture, as you can see here. This is actually how most people stand up there at the top right, the one with the little X. They kind of got like a little slouch to them. And, and just stretching and just even faking that you have that good posture can bring uh, a good posture into, into your life, which is important. And uh, one good thing for that that I've noticed is actually yoga. As you can see at the bottom right is a really good stretch for your back. And the lower back is where a lot of the pain comes from. For people in why they slouch and, and not having their shoulders kind of brought it out. It's called child's pose. And um, this woman right here has been doing a high plank which also gets kind of your back arched a little bit so that when you stand up, you don't feel as much pain as you would regularly. Because most people actually suffer from a lot of back pain just when you sit down, you're slouching a lot. Even just standing, they're kind of just bent over, which is not very good for you. Um, for my second benefit, it's the uh, range of motion. As you can see here, this, this man is stretching. And for the most part, people do lie in kind of like that beginner area. And uh, you can't really see it, but that blue section right there would be expert. And people tend to not really be able to pass that 90 degree level, which is actually really important when you want to be kind of like an athlete or anybody that does any sort of uh, consistent physical activity. It's going to improve your flexibility, improve performance of physical activity. Because you're more flexible, you're going to be able to perform with better form. And, and for that reason, you're going to be able to add more weight to the, to the things you do. And um, it just works out for you when you're actually working out as well. <clears throat> I just have a little video here of, um, of this guy. He's kind of improving your hip mobility and the range of motion of it, which is very important for, for you doing any kind of lower um, body activity, whether it's running, sprinting, or just a straight up workout. I'm gonna get down on the floor and my knee bends 90 degrees here. My back leg is also gonna be bent 90 degrees. I'm gonna give you a yoga block to prop myself up. I'm going to do my external rotation of my left hip, the internal rotation of my right hip. I'm gonna hold this for about a minute. I'm gonna stick this leg, push it into the ground, hold that.
Yeah, hip mobility is probably one of the best things for, for your lower body. And um, actually, one of the goalkeepers on my soccer team does this stretch a lot. And he's probably one of the most flexible people I've ever seen. He's got very good posture and stands very well, which is very good for him. Um, so another benefit of stretching is actually preventing injury. So the warm up of the blood and flexibility is good for muscles when they're under tension. So if you're going to be like lifting weight, your blood wants to be already have, have been warmed up. If you just go straight into putting some heavy weight on there and, and going at some um, kind of exercise, you have a high chance of hurting yourself. And what's also important that people don't know is warming up your joints and um, for movement because of the fluidity and you'll be able to handle more weight because it doesn't matter how much muscle you have, you're probably never in your life going to be able to uh, lift a thousand pounds on a bench press. You're not going to be able to do that. Your joints just can't handle it. They would just snap in half. So uh, warming up your uh, muscles as well as your joints is very important. <clears throat> I just have a video of um, of a guy warming up his arms because there's a lot of elbow pain that you can get while working out. It's kind of a weird guy, but he's performative. Hi, my name is Michael Blanc from URNC Sports Medicine. In this video series, I want to show you many of the techniques that you can do to help improve the flexibility of the tissues of the forearm to help prevent golfer's elbow and tennis elbow from occurring. The stretches I'll be showing you are relatively simple and only take a few minutes to do. These are best performed right after you train. So let's start by looking at the stretch for the lateral muscles of the forearm. Simply extend your elbow out in front of you, hold it in a thumb down position, and flex your wrist back. Hold it for about 30 seconds and do that exercise three times. do the same exercise to help stretch the muscles on the inside part of the arm. Turn to a palm up position, again with the elbow extended, and pull back, holding for about 30 seconds. These two exercises should help prevent injuries like golfer's elbow and tennis elbow. My name is Michael Block from URMC Sports Medicine. So what I'm trying to prove is that stretching in general is good. If, even if you're not active, doing some little uh, little elbow stretch like that that he was doing could, could help prevent arthritis or uh, something like carpal tunnel, which you probably don't want. So my fourth benefit of stretching is decreasing um, soreness. So this is not actually guaranteed to decrease soreness. Um, it also it's going to depend on how much weight you do and um, how much exercise you do, whether you will even get sore at all. So if, that's how it's just depending on how sore you will get. Um, there's an experiment of um, on Cochrane database where they had about 2,500 uh, people and they would go through kind of the same exercises and have one group uh, stretch before and after. And it was kind of concluded, it's, it's kind of a weird like in between, but it was kind of concluded that stretching before and after could um, potentially benefit um, you in, in decreasing the soreness. And so my last uh, benefit is breathing control, which is very important. So when you breathe in, there's uh, tension on your muscles. And when you breathe out, you're reducing the tension. So um, this kind of enhances your physiological action when you're stretching. So you want to get your breathing right, which is very important. That's why yoga is, is extremely important to stretching. Um, and it's not good to hold your breath. There's actually any yoga class with all ladies above 50 years old, and I was the only one in there sweating the whole time and struggling to breathe. It was actually quite impressive to think that they could do. It wasn't very flexible, but the, the breathing control was the, probably the most important part about it. And it's kind of a way of meditation as well, which is also good for your body. It likes to get a little release like that. So these are my sources for that day in this presentation. Thank you. Let's give the day to do another round of applause. We were here on Friday from the members of the team, Haley Hunt, Abby Judge, 
Matthew Podolsky, Lisa Alpha, and so, so. Okay, stay safe, everybody. And have a good day. And more talk at Doorbell. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this box. Um, yeah. You said we could um, we could get the video of the, of what we did, right? Yeah, that will send the file to you. Okay. Do you, do you want me to email you about it? Or uh, you... yeah, just email it to me, and then what's going to happen? Uh, Dr. Dennis is going to go back in, and he'll need to um, just converge all the speeches. His computer, okay. And we'll send a file to you. Just send that email for three lines. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You did a good job on that. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right.